What's up everyone, Jay here from Tap and Turn Gaming, coming at you today with some more Oath of the Gatewatch spoilers. So uh, if any of you have been following um, the spoilers on this, some of you may have heard about the whole uh, Wizards of the Coast thing getting all, you know, crazy and butthurt over people uh, spoiling their cards from this upcoming set. Um, I ended up reading something on, um, on Reddit about uh, the people who leaked the cards were uh, Wizards of the Coast judges, uh, oh, more specifically Magic the Gathering judges, and uh, those judges, some of them were banned for a very long time, some of them were banned for a few months for leaking the cards, so uh, for a while we hadn't had any new spoilers from Oath of the Gatewatch, um, but today we have quite a few to take a look at, so let's just jump right on into it. So, uh... First up, we're going to take a look at some commons, you know, basic stuff, but uh, there are some new keywords that we're going to talk about. So this card is Shoulder to Shoulder. It's a three-cost white sorcery with a new ability. Uh, actually, it's not really new. Um, <laughs> it's basically reinforced from the Lorwyn block. Uh, it's very similar to that, but uh, here's Shoulder to Shoulder. It has Support 2, so what that is is you can put a plus one, plus one counter on each of up to two target creatures. So uh, if the card has support one, you can put a plus one plus one counter on one creature. If it has support two like this, you can put a plus one plus one counter on up to two creatures, support three, so on and so on. Uh, but support two and draw a card. So pretty basic, nothing crazy, but uh, you know, not a bad card by any means. Next we have comparative analysis. It's a four cost blue instant with Surge. Uh, I believe we talked about Surge in the last video. Uh, you can cast a spell for its Surge cost if you were a teammate has cast another spell this turn. Target player draws two cards. So, uh, you know, you can possibly play this for a divination cost, but uh, if you don't get the Surge cost, uh, four mana for drawing two cards isn't bad. Next we have Scion Summoner. He's a 3-cost 2-2 Eldrazi drone with the Void. When he enters the battlefield, put a 1-1 colorless Eldrazi Scion onto the board. Pretty basic there. Uh, now we're into the Uncommons. We have Jiraga Auxiliary. It's a 3-cost 2-3 Elf Soldier Ally with support 2 by paying 4 a green and a white. Um, that's basically all that does. So uh, pretty vanilla card. Uh, you know, you can start beefing up your creatures uh if it gets too late game but um you know most of these cards like the commons and uncommons you know probably don't really you know draw Derek and I's ire too much from an EDH standpoint but we did just want to talk about um the cards that were spoiled so uh some of the rares are really nice for EDH but uh you know most of these commons and uncommons are kind of meh from an EDH standpoint but some of them might be really good in you know standard or maybe other formats next we have relentless hunter it's a three cost three three human warrior uh you can pay one a red and a green and it gets plus one plus one and gains trample until end of turn so that's definitely not bad uh, a three three for three is pretty good on its own but uh, one that can pump itself and give itself trample uh, is pretty damn sweet. So I could uh, I could definitely see that being played in uh, some standard decks for sure. Next we have Flayer Drone. He's a 3 cost 3 1 Eldrazi Drone with Devoid and First Strike. And whenever another colorless creature enters the battlefield under your control, target opponent loses one life. So, uh, you know, pretty basic. Uh, the fact that he First Strikes is pretty cool, but... Uh, you know, again, from an EDH standpoint, I probably wouldn't play this card, but, uh, you know, it's definitely uh, not a bad card by any means, you know, if you're playing Draft or Sealed or maybe even Standard, you know, uh, I know there's some black-red Eldrazi aggro decks floating around in Standard right now, so, I mean, this guy might fit into a deck like that. Next we have Mind Melter. He's a 3 cost 2-2 two, two Eldrazi Drone with the Void. He can't be blocked, and you can pay 3 and a Colorless. Um, that is the new Colorless Mana Symbol, so um, that has to be a, a genuine Colorless Mana. And then the 3 can be uh, Mana from any color or Colorless Mana. Uh, and then target opponent exiles a card from his or her hand. Activate this ability only any time you could cast a sorcery. 
Uh, this card's pretty sweet. Um, the fact that it's unblockable and you can pay four to make somebody exile a card from their hand definitely isn't a bad ability at all. Uh, next we have Reflector Mage. He's a three cost two three human wizard. Uh, when he enters the battlefield, return target creature and opponent controls to its owner's hand. That creature's owner can't cast spells with the same name as that creature until your next turn. Uh, I could definitely see this being played in standard for sure. Uh, you know, with obviously you being able to play up to four copies of any given card that's not a basic land in your deck. Um, this could definitely be a nice little control card um, for some blue-white decks out there. But hell, um, I mean, I would even play this in my Brago deck. Um, you know, if your opponent's down to one card in their hand, uh, or if you bounce, you know, a creature and that's the only card in their hand, they can't recast it uh, on their turn. They have to wait until your next turn. So it's a pretty sweet card. I like it. Next we have Spatial Contortion. It's a two-cost, colorless instant. Target creature gets plus three, minus three until end of turn. So it's very similar to, uh, what is it, Nameless Inversion. Just minus the, the changeling and all that jazz. Next we have Walker of the Wastes. It's a five-cost, four-four, Eldrazi with Trample. And he gets plus one, plus one for each land you control named Wastes. Uh... Pretty, pretty garbage from an EDH standpoint, but um, <clears throat> you know maybe in draft or sealed or standard possibly he could see some play. But um, I mean, unless you're playing like a completely colorless deck in EDH, um, you know, then this guy could you know potentially be really friggin' huge because anybody out there that's got a colorless EDH deck is probably gonna want to hoard up some uh, basic wastes for their decks uh, so they don't have to you know play all these uh, random colorless lands or if you're you know building a new colorless deck around a colorless general uh, wastes could definitely be uh, something that you want to uh, stock up on next we have reckless bushwhacker he's a three cost two one uh, goblin warrior ally with surge for one and a red he has haste and when he enters the battlefield if his surge cost was paid other creatures you control get plus one plus zero oh, and gain haste until end of turn uh, Pretty sweet card. Um, you know, tribal allies, maybe. You could play him. Um, or even if you're drafting or doing sealed and you're going tribal allies, um, he could be pretty sweet uh, from an EDH standpoint. Unless you're doing tribal allies, eh, he's okay. Next we have Immolating Glare. It's a two-cost white instant destroy target attacking creature. So, uh, you know, pretty basic, but it does what it does. Next we have Prophet of Distortion. A one cost, one two with Devoid, where you can pay three and a colorless to draw a card. So uh, that's that's not bad. Uh, being able to, you know, draw cards uh, for three and a colorless definitely isn't a bad ability by any means. Would I play a one cost, one two in an EDH deck, even though it can draw me a card? Probably not. I mean, there's much better ways to draw cards in EDH than this, but uh, you know it's not a bad card overall. Now we're into the rares. Uh, here we have Hissing Quagmire. It's another one of the man lands, so it enters the battlefield tapped. Uh, taps for a black or a green, and you can pay one in black and a green, and it becomes a 2-2 black and green elemental creature with death touch until end of turn. It's still a land. So uh, that's pretty sweet, turning it into a death touching creature. Uh, is very nice. Next we have Ruins of Orin Reef. Uh, it's a rare land that comes into play tapped. Tap it for a colorless mana or tap it and put a plus one plus one counter on target colorless creature that entered the battlefield this turn. So uh, if anybody knows uh, Orin Reef the Vastwood from Zendikar, I believe that would tap to put counters on each creature that entered the battlefield. Uh, something along those lines correct me if I'm wrong in the comments but uh, this is pretty similar to it except it only targets one creature and it has to be a colorless creature next we have Seagate Wreckage uh, another rare land that taps for a colorless or we can pay two in a colorless and tap it draw a card 
activate this ability only if you have no cards in hand. Uh, I could definitely see myself playing this in some EDH decks. You know, if you're uh, if you're in top deck mode and uh, you know you need a way to draw some cards, this is a pretty nice way to do it for three mana. Not bad. Next we have Stoneforge Masterwork. It's a one cost artifact equipment. Uh, it costs two to equip. Equip creature gets plus one plus one for each other creature you control that shares a creature type with it. So if you're playing a tribal EDH deck, this is pretty nice equipment to play. Uh, here we have a new legendary creature, a merfolk wizard by the name of Jury N. Ruin Diver. He's a three cost, two, three, one in blue and a red. Whenever you cast your second spell each turn, draw a card. So it's a very interesting card. Um, you know, he is pretty cheap to play. Um, you know, a new general potentially for uh, for some people. You know, some people might want to build around this uh, card. Maybe Merfolk Tribal or Wizard Tribal or something like that. Uh, the ability is interesting, <laughs> to say the least. But, uh, you know, would I personally build a uh, deck around this guy? Probably not. But, um, you know, another option for a... Or maybe a tiny leader, you know, because he costs three. So maybe he'd be a good tiny leader. Because, you know, you could probably play multiple spells in a turn in tiny leaders. So, you know, this guy will draw you cards. So maybe he'd be a really good tiny leader, but... Uh, in uh, or leading a uh, you know like a big boy EDH deck of 99 cards not so much for me next we have Endbringer he's a six cost five five Eldrazi uh, untap him during each other player's untap step which is pretty cool uh, you can tap him to deal one damage to target creature or player uh, pay a colorless and tap him target creature can't attack or block this turn or pay two colorless and tap him to draw a card uh, he's great. He's just got all kinds of really nice abilities built onto him. Um, you know, he can ping a creature or a player. He can make something not be able to attack or block, and he can draw you cards. And it's all colorless mana to do so. So, I mean, what more can you ask for off of a completely colorless creature? He just brings a lot to the table, and I could definitely see myself playing this in an EDH deck. Next we have Deceiver of Form. He's a 7 cost 8-8 eight, eight Eldrazi. At the beginning of combat on your turn, reveal the top card of your library. If a creature card is revealed this way, you may have creatures you control other than Deceiver of Form become copies of that card until end of turn. You may put that card on the bottom of your library. Uh, that's a very, very dirty ability. Um, so... You know, just the fact that you can make every other creature on your side of the board um, a copy. Does it have to be a creature you control? Oh, yeah, well, it's when you reveal the top card of your library. So, um, you know, you can flip into something crazy. I can't even really think of anything, you know, that would be super, super good off the top of my head. But, um you know, that's a very dirty ability, and it could be very devastating uh, for somebody if you reveal the top card of your deck and it's something, you know, a bomb, and you make every creature on your side of the board except this a copy of that. It could definitely swing a game in your favor if you <laughs> reveal the uh, the right card. Maybe you uh, flip like a Dark Steel Colossus, and you turn all your creatures into, you know, 11 11 or 12 12s with trample that are indestructible that's that's pretty dirty so uh this guy gets my thumbs up he's really cool next we have eldrazi obligator a three cost three one with the void uh when you cast him you may pay one in a colorless if you do gain control of target creature until end of turn untap it it gains haste until end of turn and this has haste too uh very nice card um you know, you get a 3-1 with haste that can attack right away, and then you can also, uh, you know, act of treason and gain control of something and attack with that too. Pretty sweet car. I like it a lot. And we have Goblin Dark Dwellers, a 5-cost 4-4 with Menace, and when it enters the battlefield, you may cast target instant or sorcery card with convert a mana cost 3 or less from your graveyard without paying its mana cost. If it would go to the graveyard, exile it instead. Uh, really nice card. There's lots of uh, three or less mana cost cards in red, um, you know, like Pyroclasm, Anger of the Gods, stuff like that. So this guy definitely gets my thumbs up. 
All right, next up we have Munda's Vanguard, a 5-cost 3-3 core knight ally. So I like it already, the fact that it's a knight and an ally. But um, it has a new ability called Cohort. So I want to say that that's probably going to be exclusive to the ally creature type. But uh, what it does is you can tap it and tap an untapped ally you control and put a plus one, plus one counter on each creature you control. Uh, pretty sweet ability. Uh, it's kind of like a uh, Cathar's Crusade, just not as bonkers. But, um, you know, by simply tapping this and an untapped ally, you can essentially Cathar's Crusade and, and make your whole team bigger. So uh, this guy gets my thumbs up for sure. Next up we have Gladeheart Cavalry. It's a 7 cost 6-6 six, six Elf Knight. Uh, when it enters the battlefield, support 6. So you can put a 1-1 one, one counter on each of up to 6 target creatures. And whenever a creature you control with a 1-1 one, one counter on it dies, you gain 2 life. That's uh, kind of a meh rare. You know, it'll probably be one of those junk, like, 25 cent rares. But, uh, you know, for 7 mana for what it does... Uh, you know, I could play better cards than this to, you know, if I want to put 1-1 one, one counters on a bunch of things or gain some life, you know, I could play much better cards than this. Um, you know, it, it's not a bad card, but uh, I don't particularly care for it myself. Next we have Dread Defiler. He's a 7 cost 6-8 Eldrazi with the Void. Uh, you can pay 3 in a colorless exile a creature card from your graveyard. Target opponent loses two life. Uh, no, I'm sorry. Target opponent loses life equal to the exile card's power. Um, so that could be pretty good. Um, generally in EDH, I don't particularly want to exile stuff from my graveyard. Because, um, you know, one of the main things that you... Well, at least in my perspective, one of the main things you want to look for in an EDH deck is uh, if you have recursion elements. Because, you know... EDH is a very wrath-heavy meta, as, you know, as we all well know. And uh, you want to be able to get your stuff back from the graveyard. Uh, generally, you want to do that anyway. Uh, so this guy, the fact that he makes you exile cards from your graveyard, um, I don't really care for it. But, you know, you could potentially drain somebody for, a, you know, a shit ton, of, uh, shit ton of life if you, you know, exile something like a Darksteel Colossus or, a, you know, a Ulamog or something like that. Uh, you could definitely hit somebody pretty hard with it. But uh, from an EDH standpoint, I don't particularly care for it. Next we have Deep Fathom Skulker, a 6 cost 4-4 Eldrazi with the Void. Whenever a creature you control deals combat damage to a player, you may draw a card. That's pretty nice. And when, uh, I'm sorry, you can pay 3 and a colorless target creature can't be blocked this turn. Uh Pretty nice uh, abilities on a pretty decently costed guy. Um, so I, I like it. You know, a 4-4 four, for four, 6 isn't bad, uh, but the fact that he makes it so that when any of your creatures hit a player, you draw a card is really, really nice. And then uh, you can basically make something unblockable for 4 mana. So uh, this guy gets my thumbs up. You know, he can get your big fatties in and hit your opponent, deal that damage, and draw a card off of it. Next we have Stonehaven Outfitter, a 2 cost 2-2. Two, two. Uh, equipped creatures you control get plus 1, plus 1, and whenever an equipped creature you control dies, draw a card. Um, from an EDH standpoint, you know, this guy is very dependent on, uh, you know, having a lot of equipments out. You know, he will pump your equipped guys plus 1, plus 1, and then uh, he'll draw your cards when equipped creatures you control die. But uh, at least for me, that's kind of, uh, you know, it depends way, way too much on having equipments out. Um, you know, you'll definitely see equipment in EADH, stuff like Lightning Greaves and Dark Steel Plate and, you know, the Swords of Profit and Value and all that. But generally, you're not going to see uh, a deck that's, like, chock full of equipments. Uh, you know, maybe some of you have some decks out there that have lots and lots of equipments in them. But uh, generally, from what I've seen, my personal experience and from my own personal decks, yeah, I play equipments in a lot of my decks, but not enough to warrant taking up a slot in the 99 for this guy. Next we have Oath of Jace. It's a 3-cost legendary enchantment. 
Uh, this is the first, I would imagine, of uh, multiples of these. You know, um, we'll probably have, you know, the Oath of Jace and the Oath of Gideon and the Oath of Nyssa and the Oath of uh, Chandra. Because those are the four planeswalkers, you know, kind of pictured uh, in some of the art for this set. But uh, anyways, when this enters the battlefield, draw three cards and then discard two cards. At the beginning of your upkeep, scry X, where X is the number of planeswalkers you control. Um, the first ability is pretty nice when it enters the battlefield, draw three and discard two. Um, but the second part is very dependent on having planeswalkers on the board. Maybe you're playing a Super Friends deck, you know, this would probably be a really, really nice card to play in a Super Friends uh, style deck. Um, you know, if you're cramming all kinds of Planeswalkers into your deck, maybe you just play a lot of Planeswalkers in your deck already. Um, this could be an okay card, but, uh, you know, I probably personally wouldn't play it uh, in any of my decks. You know just that the trigger off it coming in is nice, but then it just sits there. You know, if you have no Planeswalkers on the board, you're not benefiting any, you know, type of value from it, so. Next we have Call the Gate Watch. It's a three-cost white sorcery. Search your library for a Planeswalker card, reveal it, and put it in your hand, then shuffle. So it's basically a tutor for a Planeswalker. Pretty basic. Next we have Remorseless Punishment, it's a 5 cost black sorcery, target opponent loses 5 life unless that player discards 2 cards or sacrifices a creature or planeswalker, repeat this process once. Uh, it's a pretty interesting card, um, so you know, I would probably, you know, if someone cast this on me, I would probably, you know, lose five life and then do something else like uh like sacrifice a creature or something like that um you know it can be uh, pretty devastating if your opponent you know doesn't have a lot of stuff going on on the board um or if they're at very low life and uh you know you want to get uh particular things off their board you know maybe they don't have a lot going on and they're at a low amount of life you know if they're at five or less life they're obviously not gonna want to lose five life so they're going to discard two cards or sacrifice a creature or planeswalker and the fact that you get to essentially do it twice is definitely not bad now we're into the mythic rares so here we have linvala the preserver so uh we saw linvala in rise of the eldrazi um that rendition of her i would say is still better than this one but this one's still pretty cool so uh She's a 6 cost 5-5 five, five legendary, uh, yeah, sorry, legendary Angel with flying, obviously. When she enters the battlefield, if an opponent has more life than you, you gain 5 life. Okay. When she enters the battlefield, if an opponent uh, controls more creatures than you, put a 3-3 three, three white Angel creature token with flying onto the battlefield. Pretty cool. Um, you know, dependent, again, on what's going on in the game. You know, if uh, if you're playing a multiplayer game, Someone's probably going to have more life than you at some point. So, uh, you know, you can gain some life off of this almost definitely. Um, and then, you know, again, in a multiplayer environment, somebody's probably going to have more creatures than you. So generally when you cast this, you're probably going to reap the benefits from it. Gain five life and get a 3-3 three, three flyer. Now, if you're playing this in like a flicker style deck where you can flicker it in and out and completely abuse those enter the battlefield effects, you can get a lot of value out of it. So uh, this card definitely does get my thumbs up. I like it a lot. Um, I feel like this will net you more value if you're playing like a multiplayer game. Now next we have this guy right here. And before I even talk about this guy, I just want to praise the magic gods because they finally listened to me. They finally did. I know uh, any of you that saw our spoiler videos for Battle for Zendikar... I believe I talked about the fact that I wanted a five-color legendary uh, ally creature to build a tribal ally deck around. Well, the magic gods have shined down their glory on me and have made me a very, very happy person when I saw this guy. So this is General uh, Tazri. He is a five-cost, three-four legendary human ally. Now, on the face of him... 
He costs four and a white mana, but the fact that he has this ability right here with all five colors of mana on it make it so that I can essentially use this guy to build a five color ally tribal EDH deck, and I am so happy. <laughs> so I, I finally got the legendary ally that's five colors that I wanted, and this guy's pretty damn sweet. So uh, when he enters the battlefield, you may search your library for an ally creature card, reveal it, put it in your hand, then shuffle your library. That right there is pretty sweet. So when you know he comes in, you tutor up an ally and put it in your hand. Uh, and then you can pay one mana of every color. Ally creatures you control get plus X plus X until end of turn, where X is the number of colors among those creatures. So, you know, if you have um, all five colors of mana on the mana cost of your creatures on the board, you activate that. All your allies are going to get plus five plus five. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, that's, that's really cool. I like this guy a lot, and I'm already brewing a tribal ally edh deck around this guy it's already it's already in progress so uh seeing this guy made me very very happy and i'm absolutely going to build a deck around him and that's it so uh that about wraps up the uh spoilers for uh well, at least the new spoilers for oath of the gate watch so uh let me know what you guys think of these cards in the comment section below you know if you're excited not excited uh, if there's particular cards that you're really looking forward to uh, from this set, you know, there still are cards to come. So we'll probably do another video uh, talking about some more spoilers uh, maybe in the coming week or so. But, uh, yeah, I really want to hear what you guys think uh, of these particular cards that we just looked at. Um, so, yeah, leave me some comments in the comment section below about what you think of the cards. Uh, thumbs up the video if you did enjoy it so that we know to keep making spoiler videos like this in the future. And if you're not already subscribed to Tap and Turn Gaming, please hit that subscribe button. We really do appreciate it. At the time of filming this video, we are at 980 subscribers. So thank you all for getting us up to that amount. Um, Derek and I are going to do a very special giveaway once we get to 1,000 subscribers. So, uh, you know, share our videos, you know, on social media, stuff like that. You know, spread the word about our channel for, uh, you know, anybody, friends, family, anybody that, you know, that enjoys Magic the Gathering and uh, in the Commander format, you know, let them know about our uh, channel. We really do love making these videos for you guys. So uh, we really want to get up to that 1,000 subscriber mark so we can announce what we're going to do for that giveaway once we get there. So, again, thank you, our 980 subscribers. Uh, thank you for sticking with us, and you know, like I said, just spread the word, let everybody know about our channel, and uh, get us up to that 1,000, and uh, you know, hopefully surpass that as well and reach another milestone after that. But anyways, this has been Jay with Tap and Turn Gaming. Hope everybody enjoyed the video. Like, comment, subscribe, all that stuff, and we'll catch you later. Thanks a lot for watching.